My special guest was featured back in 2019 in the New York Times. She was uh, featured as part of an online sting operation. In fact, they called her a vigilante. That's my kind of guest. Uh, she is a skepticism activist. She writes for Skeptical Inquirer. She's a co-founder of the Monterey County Skeptics. She has been awarded the James Randi Award for Skepticism in the Public Interest. She is founder of the About Time Project, which we'll get into. And uh, that's an umbrella for guerrilla skepticism on Wikipedia. She is an ambassador for the Center for Inquiry, and she can be heard on the Skeptic Zone podcast. Not enough credits for you, my friend, Susan Gerbic. <laughs> so good to have you. It's great to be here. It's nice to see you, sir. So you're dangling psychic bait. I mean, I guess we'll just start with this whole sting operation. What are we talking about? Well, we put together a whole series of investigations even before the New York Times article came out. We always call them something Operation Something Something. So we've had Operation Ice Cream Cone, Operation Peach Pit, Operation Tater Tot, Operation Onion Ring, and so on. And so we put together all kinds of various stings to expose people who claim to be able to communicate with the dead. We mostly focus on those people who have some some sort of notoriety, maybe enough to be able to have a Wikipedia page or have a TV and have a TV show. Not necessarily the psychic that's down in the corner, uh, you know, the corner of your street that has, you know, does readings there. Not not that one. We're we're looking at the the more prominent psychics and we do interchange the word psychic with medium with with grief grief vampire because it's all kind of one in the same to some extent but um i specialize mostly in hot readings and uh, that is a unique how sh should i say most psychics use cold reading and editing if they're on tv to make themselves appear to be real but a very small subset of them use hot readings which is where they go and they investigate the client beforehand and then they appear to know a lot of information about them so when you have uh somebody you suspect of being a hot reader it's a it's a you can sting them easier once you once you know the ways they come about getting the information you can plant information that no way they could know unless they were reading your social media or whatever and so that's what we've done various times okay well let's sort of unlayer that those onions real fast cold reading is I, this audience is going to be well versed in much of this but i know it might be new material for some so let's do our due diligence where cold reading is they're what reading your clothing your attire your cadence your gestures uh your age they your are, voice the way yeah. you smell what's in your background on a zoom screen and then there are warm readings and hot readings i know that some have actually used cue cards i know that there were some psychics who before you give them audience you know especially some of the celebrities you're filling out cue cards and they're picking those up and so they're already sort of uh, pre-informed about the things that they're supposed to know psychically would that qualify as a hot reading i mean help me out oh absolutely um back in the days of faith readers faith healers and so on the the audience would come in and they would fill out prayer cards and there's various ways that the that they would be able to get a hold of those prayer cards. Even Peter Popoff back in James Randi's day, they would get a basket of these prayer cards and he would just have his wife read one of the prayer cards to people and then he would cast it out to the audience. I'm getting Elizabeth Morgan, who's at 1156 North 7th Street, who has arthritis all over her body. Well, she wrote that on the prayer card right before she came in. That's hot reading also. And then once he gets her up on stage or she stands up and the cameras are on her or whatever, then he just does his spiel, you know, of like, oh, God is saving you. So faith, faith healing has done uh, hot readings. And a hot reading could also be just as simple of my like maybe your sister saying hey you've got to see this this medium she's great and so you go see the medium and this medium knows all about you well yeah your sister just told you all about about you know the problems you're having at work and so on so that's a hot reading anytime you have information about a person ahead of time is a hot read i was interested too some of the psychics have 
a team of researchers, they go out and comb the internet for information about someone in advance of a visit. By the way, Peter Popoff, for those who aren't of that generation or familiar, he's still around. I think he's still a millionaire, which is just a travesty. But he would do these faith healing services. And James Randi and another gentleman whose name escapes me were there scanning radio frequencies. And they realized he had a receiver in one of his ears. Mm -hmm. And his wife was backstage and she would read into his ear so that he could hear it from God miraculously. Hello, Petey. Can you hear me? If you can't, you're in trouble. Popoff was being prompted by his wife through a wireless earpiece. John? Dearly Johnson. She'd gotten her information from prayer cards filled out by the faithful before the show began. She's about to get rid of the walker. You want to get rid of this walker, sister? Oh, glory. How long have you been walking on that walker? About three years. Three years. She was at 1627 10th Street. 1627 10th Street? Is that right? That's right. She had that right of all over. Burning this arthritis right out of your body. And this is how gullible people are, or at least how much they want to believe. Maybe, to- yeah, maybe how much they they can't abide the idea that it was all a hoax. They've already emotionally married themselves to the hope is that when he came forward afterwards and said it wasn't an earpiece, it was a hearing aid, no one stopped to ask why a faith healer would have hearing loss. (laughs) I thought that was a big omission. Um, Tell me about grief vampires. That's a term that you use often. Let's flesh it out. Well, Mark Edward, my partner, came up with that term. It is kind of to distinguish between a person who communicates with, who says they communicate with the dead from a person who's doing tarot readings or astrology or, you know, tea readings or whatever. It's somebody who's going to try to find your grief and try to latch on to the grief. And your grief could be um, somebody who has died or it could be maybe, um, you know, that you you have in some sort of inferior complex that you that that they can use as a grief they can uh, manipulate to get you to do more readings and to take your money out of you or to get power over you it's not always about the money a lot of it is about power a lot of it is about manipulation so a grief vampire is somebody who would be trying to find your grief trying to find a hook into you so that they can manipulate you for whatever reason that they're manipulating you. So beyond the John Edwards types who are, you know, shilling these psychic powers for cash, somebody, a spouse, a life partner who is maybe a malignant narcissist might be a grief vampire sort of sucking you dry in that way. (laughs) Possibly. yeah. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I suppose so. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I find that manipulators find people when they are vulnerable or they find their vulnerabilities and prey upon them, right? The uh, sociopathic part of them does not empathize. And so it really becomes about control and serving the self. I know that's probably a whole other conversation. You and I could go out for coffee and talk about that, Susan, (laughs) forever. Okay. So you're creating fake social media accounts as bait for the psychics. Do I understand that? Yes, we've done it in many different forms. We've done it using email. We've used uh, Facebook. Um, you can do it also just in person to some extent. Um, there's there's different forms of doing it, depending on which way you think that it will bait the psychic. And also, sometimes I've, I've done these things to the same individual, and I don't want them to, you know, I would think they'd be wary of uh, Facebook again, but no, we can catch them again using Facebook. I don't quite know why they haven't caught on there. They're fully aware of what I'm doing, but I think they haven't had enough repercussions. And I think that's why they're just continuing because it's very successful for them financially. And there's always another person who's willing to throw money at them. So if you and I are having this very public conversation, am I, am I burning the undercover agents, you know, by talking about this? No, Mm -mm. no, everything's hidden away and 
I don't think okay. it's a problem at all. But well, I think I don't... people should be wary of what you do. Not that you shouldn't put things on social media, but just be aware that anything on social media can be held against you. Don't assume that you're you have some privacy controls because we can find out almost anything about anybody. Anybody who's been alive has had been in the newspaper, either, you know, mentioned in an obituary for a family member or you were in a choir in elementary school or, uh, you know, we can find information about you. So don't be so complacent that you can't. Oh, you know, the Internet already freaks me out. We were talking about a specific recipe the other day. We were just talking. I wasn't on my phone. Yeah, We were just in the kitchen. And then I logged on to something and there was an ad for the very type of food we were just talking about. And I was like, yes, Lord, (laughs) (laughs) or yes, Google or Facebook or somebody's watching or listening. You know, when I brought in our uh, Amazon Echo, I told Natalie, I said, I can't believe I purposefully brought in uh, an active listening device into the walls of my home. But at the same time, I love it. You know, so Mm -hmm. when you say there is no privacy, sometimes I wonder about the things I don't know about. Do you ever wonder, do you think maybe it's the stuff we aren't aware of that should be the most terrifying? No, I'm not too terrified, but I do think we should be aware that there is no, I mean, there's always a way of finding out something or, and just pure chance. I mean, or coincidence. Well, what's the, again, share only as much as you can or wish to about your methodology, but what is a fake social media account doing are you acting like a mark well possibly okay so our most recent sting is called operation onion ring and we infiltrated a social spirit oh it's called a spirit circle with eight people involved four hundred dollars per person and the psychic was thomas john and i've written about this so i can reveal whatever whatever uh would be of interest to you but what we did is i only had four days to pull it off what he was doing is he was going to the spirit circle was focused on children from five to 12. So we were kind of not too keen on that idea at all. That was pretty, pretty bad. So what he would do is he was, you know, they paid $400. The parent had to be there with them. And then they came on to a zoom call and then they had, he read them. And what he was reading was their social media, their mother's, social media presence okay uh, for, forgive me uh, i don't mean to interrupt you but i want to be clear a spirit circle where the medium was targeting young children did i hear that right yeah well they the parents paid four hundred dollars for the child to have a reading from the medium what's the attitude of a parent oh they they totally buy it they want their child to be special um this this particular spirit circle that we, that we attended was to help the child to understand that they may have mediumship qualities themselves if they saw spirit people or shadow people or whatever circumstances uh thomas john was explaining to them that that they possibly have powers themselves so the parents were all into it they loved it and in a lot of ways the parent was getting a reading because of course the children don't have social media presence so what he would do is he would just say your grandmother or your great grandmother when referring to the child. But really what he was doing was he was just reading the parents, the mother's um, social media and just regurgitating it so that it was aimed towards the child. Oh yeah, this is absolutely uh, happening. They, the uh, parents were all for it. They were sitting right there next to them and proud as heck that their child was getting a reading. Our little Timmy seems to have a gift kind of thing. Well, it was more that it was explaining that a couple of the children were saying that they no longer could, were dreaming about their family member who had died. And they felt egregious, you know, sad about that because the parent obviously is pushing them is, is, you know, the children are growing up and moving on and they don't remember grandma like they did before, but the mothers, and it's always mothers, um, were pushing them again and saying, well, you know, what about you know, when grandma used to call you this or grandma, you know, you can feel that the mother is still feeling the grief. So they're, they're laying it on the child and the child in at least two of the circumstances. And I, I mean, I have this all recorded and it was really hard to watch. These children are crying uh, when they're called on and they, uh, you just want to reach out and hug them. It just feels awful. 
they're they're feeling like you know they're moving on but the parent wants them to stay in the place where they were where they're connected to their parents the grandparent or whatever it's it's really difficult to watch um one 12 year old she was she was she was saying that she couldn't connect like she had in the past and she felt you could feel that she felt so much guilt about that and the mother was um you know kind of like it'll happen again kind of thing and and thomas john is saying oh yeah you're growing up you'll move past the stage and then you'll be able to get back to where you're connecting with dead people again it was it was excruciating to watch seth it was really hard um, you feel for these children, they're, they're easily being manipulated and the parents are buying into it. They loved it. They, this is great. In one case, one of the parents was, um, was a medium herself. And, um, we found her on social media because it's on zoom. You could see her name right there. So we just did a quick look on social media and there she was. She had, um, showed up with her six year old. Um, she had an eight year old son who refused to be on the call. And so she showed up with the other child instead, because he's like, I don't want anything to do with this. But the mother was a medium. Well, she claims to be a medium. She has a business, no, some no name uh, psychic medium that out there, but she, she truly believes this is for the best of her children. Interesting. I read an article years ago talking about how children train to think in magical terms grow up and often have a much more difficult time navigating the real world, differentiating um, fact from fiction, truth claims that are false from actual truth. You know, I, I don't know. I, have you developed an opinion about conditioning young people for this sort of, I don't know, for looking for supernatural or magical solutions in the natural world? You know, I really don't know. I was raised um, in a religious household, totally credulous, totally believing in astrology and and all kinds of, of weird things. But, you know, I turned out all right. I think that... Um, <laughs> well, I'm glad for that. Some people say so. But I, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think that we really don't... We really don't know. I think it just depends on the environment. These kids may rebel completely against their parents in the long run. We don't know. I think that it's not healthy. I think in their, in their, uh, this childhood in this time when they're just starting to form their opinions about things, I think it's, I think it's dangerous, but I mean, the argument could also be made that Santa Claus is telling them Santa Claus is real is dangerous. At the very least, know. it made me a late bloomer. It took me, you know, an extra few decades to realize that maybe, you know, maybe that a lot of these outlandish, outrageous claims might not be substantiated. But, you know, there's hope. I got there. I mean, I got there. So if I can figure it out, maybe somebody else can. Um, all right. Well, let's say I've experienced grief. Hypothetical. I've lost a child. And I only use that because it is an example, I think, of the type of raw grief that people experience when they are preyed upon and so i somebody hangs a shingle and says i speak to the dead i can connect you with your lost child right. and i go in and pay whatever the fee is and i sit down what kind of thing might i experience if a grief vampire targets me what might i be in for well if it's a local um you know psychic and and so on they're probably just going to try to keep having you come in regularly maybe every month or every week or a few times a year to come in and get a tarot reading or a, a whatever and, and say they're communicating with your child it could be just that simple that you know it it's it's it depends on how you want to evaluate that is if that's harm or not i think Anytime anybody's lying to you, especially about something as personal and intimate as, as a death, um, those people, I don't think necessarily are going to do hot readings other than once you've gone to a medium um, and you go to them again, it's a hot reading because they've already seen you, right? So they can just make a few notes and say, oh, the last time she was here, she talked about her sister who had died, you know, and then the next time you come in, they just say, oh, your sister was in, she's here again. And now she's wearing a blue coat and she's out in the garden. I mean, so that's a hot read, obviously when you have it multiple times, but if, if you are um, one of these victims that is, had lost a child, 
And I see this all the time on Facebook where you can see how people are posting um, over and over. They're posting years even after the death of their child or their other family member. And it's just um, the posts are very emotional. You know, they're talking about happy times they had with them and and so on. And then how much they miss them. And it, it's 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 painful to see that they probably should see a grief counselor of some sort, but not a psychic uh, um, medium. Because what happens is we manipulate the memories, right? So a lot of these people say they're helping. The grief vampires say they're helping out somehow, manipulating the grief, you know, helping them with the grief. I don't, I don't think lying to somebody is ever going to be helpful. I think that um, there are experts who are licensed and trained to be able to do this to be able to help you with through your grief and we all grieve differently so it may take a very long time for some people to get over their grief but um when somebody's manipulating it saying you know oh your dad was a really happy guy he just loved you so much and you know these could be very complex emotions you don't know what actually is behind that the father may be abusive and now you feel this a, a massive amount of guilt over how you spoke to your dad towards the end of his life when you've always thought he was this you know not too great guy and now the psychic saying oh he he's he was actually a really good guy you know i don't know it's just wrong for somebody to be telling you a lie about something and and reformatting your memories you know you're thinking differently now because uh, a memory is apparently as science tells us is not like putting a vcr back in the day putting a vcr in and it plays at the same time every time you you listen to that you access that memory you tend to rewrite your memories over time so if somebody is telling you a new memory then it could be just as real as the real memory so you know we, we really shouldn't be manipulating people like this talking here with activist and skeptic susan gerbic who has done a lot of work dealing with learning about and exposing psychics, especially at the celebrity level. Do you think they're all grifters or do you think some people, some of these readers, psychics, mediums are just deluded? They really believe the uh, the bullshit. Well, when you get into the higher uh, levels where they're on TV and they're um, hot reading, then it, there is no doubt in my mind that they know darn well what they're doing because you cannot go onto somebody's social media account and get some tidbits that you repeat later as if they came from the hereafter or the spirit world and not know that you are totally making this up and that you're grifting them so a hot reader knows darn well what they're doing same with when they get into the editing process where you can make things happen and, and change things around the real magic happens in the editing room as you probably know seth so <laughs> you can make people sound better or you know take things out or or change things around it's not that difficult and, and people have been doing it for a long time since we've been able to do this with um tv shows but um there are a few people and my, my partner mark edwards says that probably 2.5 percent of the population are actually good people who have talked themselves into this and believe that they really are helping um another two and a half percent he says are probably not um they're having some sort of mental problems they think they're communicating with the dead but he says and he's been around a lot longer and i am in this world 95 percent are, are just they know darn well they're fooling though some do believe their own um bit you know they think that sometimes they get a sometimes a coincidence happens or um people are gushing all over them about oh what an amazing person you are oh my gosh your gift is amazing and i think that probably sometimes they think you know maybe i do have a gift here but we no, tend I, to uh count the hits and ignore the misses right i mean absolutely. you walk into the grocery store a hundred times with not without incident and then on the hundred and first time you bump into someone you haven't seen in 30 years and it wow, the universe must have coordinated this encounter. It's, everything happens for a reason. You've heard that one, right, Susan? Oh, yeah. And you did just earlier in the in the call, you said that maybe the echo was, uh, you were in the kitchen and you heard a recipe and you were talking about a recipe and then you, then you get an ad. That's yeah. remembering the hits and forgetting the misses right there because you probably see ads all the time for food products that have nothing to do with the conversation you've had earlier. 
There was a study that was referenced in the New York Times article from 2018. Nearly 95,000 psychic, quote, businesses exist in this country right now to the tune of $2 billion in annual revenue. Big business. You want to speak to the money? Oh, my gosh. That is only what we know about. So a lot of the psychics use cash or they use cash apps. So I'm sure that's not being reported. So just, you know, expand that tenfold. And that's probably more what we're talking about as far as finances. And then the pandemic happened. And with the lockdown, people have become a lot more insecure. They, uh, you know, you had a lot more death. You had a lot of people not able to say goodbye to their family members. They're taking them to the hospital. And then, you know, maybe you could FaceTime them and that was it. So during the pandemic, psychics moved to Zoom. And um, as people lost their jobs and so on, and they needed employment, they would turn to just putting up a Facebook page and doing uh, doing readings. So it's been really prolific during the last few years that we even have more people who are saying they're they're psychic and able to do these readings on TikTok. Oh my gosh, you can't you 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 can't go five feet without bumping into somebody who's doing tarot readings or horoscopes or or that kind of thing. So they're, I'm sure they're not reporting most of that income. So that, that, what was it? $2 billion or yeah, that's yeah. probably nothing. I'm sure it's far more than that. By the way, that's the plot of one of my favorite horror movies. It's on shutter. It's called host. And it's about an online seance that goes horribly wrong. That of course being fiction. And we know all about it. The whole idea of a zoom I guess the word seance, you know, the reading, whatever, you know, you're supposedly connecting to the spirit world mm -hmm. from long distance. You know, what a wild 21st century phenomenon. Have you been involved? Have you watched in the wings uh, an online oh, yes. Zoom thing? What's it look like? What's it feel like? Oh, absolutely. It's a quite emotional. You feel very badly for the parent, for the people in the event. It's, it's, um, I mean, they're crying and they're just reaching for anything. If you're in one of these events, and I've been in many of these events, like you have 300 people on the Zoom screen and the psychic is calling on one or two people in the chat area, you can see people calling out for anything. Like maybe the psychic will say, I'm getting a Michael and he's got a connection to New York and something about fishing. Well, you can imagine how many people that would you know, relate to thinking about how many people we actually know. And you see people in the chat going, I have a Michael, I have a, he fished. Oh my gosh. And, and yes, he lives in New York or whatever. And they're, they're clinging on to anything to try to get the psychic's attention. Me, 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 me. That's my guy. That's my guy. You know, and it's just, it's so emotional and they're, you know, well, you had mentioned uh, earlier the, the young child with the, the online meeting. And I wondered, had you ever submitted yourself? Have you ever um, in some way relatively anonymously engaged the medium? Oh, yeah. Well, that's the whole New York Times article is that Mark Eddard and I self, myself went in Operation Pizza I'm, se I'm setting you up, Susan. I want to hear the story. <laughs> oh, well, my gosh, I'm full of stories. So okay. Operation Pizza Roll, Mark Edward and myself, we went to the reading as different characters. We went as uh, Susanna uh, Forsyth Wilson and Mark Wilson, because we had ID in those names. And we, my team had created uh, social media over 10 days. They created social media for the characters of Susanna Forsyth Wilson and Mark Wilson. And in those Facebook pages, it told a story about our lives. It was totally fictional. And we did not have access to those Facebook pages. So we didn't know what was on those Facebook pages. And when we walked into the venue and we sat down, we, um, you know, what we did is I texted the team and said, I'm in the building, I'm, I'm sitting here. And then my team went onto those fake Facebook pages, tagging the psychic saying, oh, I'm here. I'm so excited to be here and so on. I really hope to get into contact with my, my dear twin brother. Andy, who died of pancreatic cancer, and so on. So they just continued the story. Now, Mark and I were given a little bit of information to attend because we had to know when to raise our hand 
when the psychic is up on the stage and he says, I'm getting a twin brother who wants to reach out to his sister, I have to know when I'm going to put my hand up. So we were given a basic amount of information, him and I, for their two, two different stories. And so when the psychic, and it was Thomas John, again, that I mentioned in Operation Onion Ring, he gets up and he says, I'm getting a, 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 a twin who wants to reach out to his, his sister. I raise my hand. And then he says, and then I think he died of something in the stomach area. I think it was pancreatic cancer. And then I said, yes. And then I pretend to cry, you know, I'm dabbing at my eyes and so on. And then he went on reading Mark and myself for 15 minutes about characters we had no idea any information on. And he went in depth and he kept reading and reading about our family. And we kept you know, pretending to cry and we didn't have the answers. So sometimes he would say things to us and we would just pretend, oh, that was my father. No, I think it was my brother. Oh, yes, we did live in Michigan for a while. I don't know what's on the Facebook pages. The psychic obviously does. I don't. So how do you reconcile that whenever you're all done? And he says, you know, we <laughs> and we don't expose ourselves at the at event. We wait until we're outside of the event and we do our research and we look at the Facebook pages to see what was recorded and what was actually on the Facebook pages. And he's he's basically reading the Facebook pages back to us that we had no idea what was on those Facebook pages. So that was pretty much the plot of uh, Operation Pizza Roll right there. Boom, boom. So you, he's supposed to have an an immediate psychic connection to you, the person, but the profile is somebody else, somebody totally. And he never reads me or Mark. So now I have obviously real dead people in my life. Well, that sounded really weird. No, I understand. I understand. Okay, there are people in my life. I was going to say I understood the spirit of what you were saying, but that made it even worse, Susan. (laughs) Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, But he never once said that. He never said anything about my real parents who have died. He never said anything about my sister who has died or Mark's family. It was, it was, he never said, you know, I'm getting something nefarious about you, that you're here under uh, false pretenses that the money that paid for these readings, which was $160 a person, was came out of a fund given to you by James Randy. I mean, my gosh, that should have really alerted him, you would think. But no, he didn't read me. He didn't read the person who was sitting in front of him. He read the Facebook profiles that we had planted as bait for him to find. And so it was so obvious he's hot reading. And, and this isn't the only circumstances. And Operation Onion Ring with the children, we planted children in there. We brought children in. And he did, it was over Zoom. So he's got eight children there. And two of them are from our team. One of them is Bailey Harris, uh, oh. that your, your audience may know. Her and her mother sat there. She was 12. Well, she was 14. But we, she played a 12-year-old. And she sat there the whole time for two hours with these other students. And then we had a a team in New Zealand and they're there. And all they were given was I made fake uh, emails and I made the accounts as generic as possible, the emails, so you wouldn't be able to search for them, Joe Martin. And then I gave him a story in the email. I sent them the email and it said just some basic information about the 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 child who was attending and then he read them and all he read was what was on those facebook i mean the emails that i had sent twice and he went through and just gave them all the information that was on there just changed a little bit to make it sound like it was coming from the dead i guess and then he added a little bit of color because what i did is i made it so impossible for him to google those persons because there was it was a very narrow amount of information I gave him. And because I'd given him $400 and we're, you know, two people out of the other, uh, out of a group of eight, he had to, um, he didn't have a lot of information. So he just read that little bit. And at no time did he read them personally. Like he didn't say, you know, something about the dead persons that would be in in their actual lives. He just made generic statements about students, you know, do well in school and all that kind of stuff. And then what information we gave him. And that was Operation uh, Onion Ring. Was the $400 the standard ticket or did you pay extra in the hopes of getting their attention? Well, it was an eight person event. So everybody was going to be read. 
So okay, all right. Yeah. So it was like a flat fee for the whole crew. And, I'm trying. Yeah. I'm trying to understand like the monetary benefits. You don't blow the whistle then. You go back, you assemble the info, you organize your thoughts, you get it ready. What's a whistle blowing look like when you leave a session like that? What do you do? Well, we go back and we make sure that everything that we were recording recorded because <laughs> <laughs> we're recording everything and we're taking photos and uh, we interact with the people at the events. Um, trying to talk to them about, you know, their history with the psychic. We play the, we play the characters, you know, we get in line at the bathroom and talk about how excited we are to be there and who are you here to see? So we're, we're fully in the role and we do pay the top price because we want to get into the VIP events and um, schmooze with people. So we're, we're totally in character the whole time. And when we leave the event, or if it's a, a zoom a zoom event or whatever we're in character from the moment you know you get out of your car necessarily because you never know who's going to be watching you could get in an elevator with somebody and it would be somebody who's who's doing the you know is going to follow you to the to the event and you're talking about your trip to hawaii and how your daughter just told you she was pregnant you know and you're telling your friend so i mean hot reading can happen at any time i always knew Susan Gerbic was a method actor. You know, she inhabits the character, inhabits the character, as all great thespians do. You've mentioned uh, Mark Edwards' name several times, mentalist, magician. To me, sounds like a Darren Brown type. Can you tell me about the man? Oh, well, Mark Edwards, he's just a wonderful guy. He's here in the other room. <laughs> well, I, I mean, other than he's a sweet fella. Oh, but yes. the fire in his belly comes from, since he's not here to defend himself, let's talk right. about him as as kind of a co-skeptic and co-exposer okay. of the charlatans. You know, like Darren Brunt, Penn Gillette is a great example, right? He knows how the sausage is made. He knows what's going on behind the scenes. He knows the, the tricks. And he leads with, hey, everybody, these are tricks. And then he does the trick in the, in the audience. All they're all in on it. He never uses this stuff in a disingenuous way. And Darren Brown is great at going out and doing mentalism and specific things that look supernatural. And he will flat out tell you, uh, you know, this is all like I, I'm messing with you. It sounds like Mark does much of the same stuff. Right. So he's a mentalist. He has performed at the Magic Castle for years and years and years. He is a, um, his expertise is in the seance room. He is an expert on the Houdini seance. And he has been doing this and working as a psychic, um, infiltrating their, the world of psychics. And he wrote a book called Psychic Blues. It's an audio book as well as a print book. It's called Psychic Blues, Confessions of a Conflicted Medium. And so he knows a lot about the business of the psychic world you know what's going on probably in the 1990s 1980s what was happening in the spirit world uh businesses so that's his uh, world of expertise and his book is mainly about that era um the 900 lines the you know dial a psychic kind of like thing. the miss cleo kind of yeah. stuff he oh, was wow. on the uh the friends network i think and he's actually they did infomercials that played at like two in the morning. So he no, was, I, I forgive yeah. me. We are showing our age. I hate to keep interrupting, but I want to make sure that people are tracking as we move forward before I forget the 900 phenomenon for those who are too young to know what that is, is you used to dial from a landline. And I think it was, uh, maybe you could do it from your cell as well, where you would be charged like a dollar 99 a minute. And you would three ninety nine for someone like Miss Cleo. Mm -hmm. And so they set the hook and they keep you on the freaking phone for as long as they can. Hi, this is Linda Georgian with a quick reminder about how simple it is to get your own personal psychic reading on the Psychic Friends Network. By calling the number on your screen, you'll be connected to the home or office of a professional psychic who cares about your future. All calls to the Psychic Friends Network are personal and confidential. So whether you have a question about love, romance, success, or money, call the Psychic Friends Network today. All it takes is a telephone and an open mind. You must be 18 to call. Just $3.99 per minute but the 900 phenomenon and that was also the satanic panic right so now you've got people worried about the devil or they're at least they're engaged in these sort of spiritism type conversations was the satanic panic part of mark's story as well no 
no, he never got involved in that. He was, uh, he stayed mainly with the psychic world and um, dealt with that. So whenever I met up with him in 2009, um, I was already interested in psychics and the psychic world, but uh, we became a lot more um, involved in doing something about it, trying to expose it and trying to um, show how, how it works. And the, the idea of, um, they call it, um, which you said with Darren Brown and Pendulette do where they say a disclaimer. I mean, that doesn't necessarily work. You can say to, you can say to your blue in the face that this is all a trick and people will come up afterwards and they'll still say, I, I know you said it was a trick, but <laughs> I, I want to know how you really did it. So, so a disclaimer of saying it is, it's, it's kind of nonsense. You have to have, um, as far as disclaimers go, your venue is pretty much your disclaimer. And if you if you do psychic readings or you do uh, something that looks like you're you're playing an actor, you're playing a role. If you do seances and they do feel like you're real, well, then within thirty seconds of they've got your business card or they go onto your website, it's clear that you're a magician and is somebody who could be hired as a as an actor. You know, so disclaimers are kind of wiggly wobbly depending <laughs> i've seen people get very upset because people mentalists don't disclaim because but then an actor doesn't disclaim either if somebody's playing shakespeare they don't get up at the end of the movie and say oh by the way i'm an actor just let no, me but, know, you know but the human it. desire to believe you know well, i i'm i we see it so often and i totally understand it's one of the reasons that that i'm that I don't go so hard on everyday Christians for being Christians because I were one, but I had a tremendous desire to hold on to it. You know, it was a cherished part of me, my identity, and and it's it served me. You can understand even evolutionarily how religions in that way may have, you know, you understand why people can latch on to them. And I feel the same must be true for the psychic world, the spirit world. You know, we want to believe. Right. Do you feel like it's in, that's innate, Susan? Absolutely. Well, I think that we all have something that we hold on to. We can't, you know, people are busy with their lives. We're raising our children. We're trying to make a living. We're keeping our house clean. We're, you know, there's so much that's going on in our lives. We don't have time to be also diving into um, some of the things in our life that we thought were just natural, like ghosts or, um, you know, going to the moon or uh, pyramid power. You just assume that your parents told you the right thing and you just believe it, religion, so on. It's part of your culture in a lot of ways. It's your, it's just part of you being you. And until you're finally challenged with some of these things, you know, does Bigfoot exist? You know, maybe you always believed, of course, Bigfoot exists, but why would you even, why would you even think that you should challenge it? If until somebody kind of comes head to head and you go, wait a minute, are you telling me that when we used to go out into the woods, that was a Bigfoot out there that we could hear knocking on trees or whatever? So people need to believe in something, I think. Um, it's 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 philosophical. I don't really do philosophy that much, as my friends always tell me. <laughs> I'm more of a facts, facts <laughs> kind of person than this hypothetical world. But I really do believe that we should probably give a and this is probably uh, one of the problems in the skeptic community is we don't give enough um we don't sympathize enough with the people who are in these situations it's a very vulnerable situation that you find yourself in at times in your life and when the medium enters during that moment of time where you're grieving you're confused about life you you're you know somebody your significant partner has left you or your job or, you know, your family's health or whatever it is, when they enter at that moment, that's when you're vulnerable and your, your, your critical thinking skills may not be at the height that they should be. I think we need to be a lot more sympathetic. These are people who are being preyed on. And I use that to mean prey, P-R-E-Y, not yeah. P-R-A-Y. And so I think that we, if we were to look at ourselves as being vulnerable too, maybe not for the specific con, but others like it, we can fall for this. It could be a multi-level marketing scheme, you know, for one of us, totally, completely different from the psychic world. But again, it's somebody manipulating somebody else. I would like to see us turn up the empathy factor. 
you know, I see, especially online. I mean, I think in real life, it's a little softer, but online it's, you know, they're all stupid. Who would be so much of an idiot to fall for this? And we see this in cults, right? This myth that only dumb people would ever believe what a cult member says or what a cult claims. And then you see people who extricate themselves and talk about what it was like. And they're highly, often highly intelligent, thoughtful people who are simply victims, you know, who are brainwashed. And I, I'm a I'm a fan of your empathetic approach, you know, where we're so reductive online instead to see the whole person and see them as victims first and start there. Let's finish here. How do we I mean, this is your subjective answer. I'm sure a lot of skeptics would answer differently. How do I bullshit proof myself out there? Somebody wants to prey on me. There's a grief vampire or a bank account vampire or whatever. And they relate it to the spirit world. How do I tool myself up? Well, you know, <laughs> um, I don't think there's really a great way of doing that because these things happen to people in vulnerable moments. And how do you keep yourself from being vulnerable? I don't know. Because, you know, right next to the uh, the cousin, the kissing cousin of psychics is like these romance scams. So, I mean, I think we're all going to be vulnerable to to something. Hang like on, Susan. I'm sorry. What is a romance scam? Oh, my gosh. You know, these sweetheart scams where they, oh, everybody out there is getting on social media, somebody approaching you saying that they, you have a nice smile and they oh. want to, get to know you better. And then, you know, then you enter into conversation with them and then they have some kind of crisis and then you have to send money to them again, like a cult. There's nobody joins a cult. I mean, they, they're joining some movement, right? <laughs> well, there's a documentary about a guy like that. Uh, it's on Netflix. I want to say it's like the worst person. In the, I'm trying to think of what the title was, but it was this guy who would come up with this idea. He would claim to be rich and famous and he would go and find people who were looking for a man who was rich and famous and then he would have some sort of a financial crisis or somebody was coming after him. He was a victim in some way. His bank accounts were locked. I need thousands to get myself out of it. And these people got sucked in. They were groomed, right? Well, absolutely. And only invulnerable. So only some people are going to fall for this. I think you're talking about the Tinder swindler. Yeah, yeah. The Tinder swindler. Yeah. Yes. I thank seen you. It, but people have talked about it. And I've seen catfishing, catfish. There's a documentary about that too. Oh, of course. And it's only going to happen in vulnerable times. I think the best way people can keep um, themselves from falling for these kinds of uh, frauds or uh, is to keep good people around you, people who you can talk to who are, you know, legitimately your friends who are going to tell you to your face that uh, this looks dangerous. You're starting to go down a path. It looks like a, a pyramid scam or or um, somebody is trying to manipulate your emotions. They're trying to isolate you from your friendships and your your past and your family. I think that keeping good people around you, having a great, strong social network around you. And if you don't have this already, you should try to find it. And I think that that's probably the best way of keeping yourself from being vul vulnerable and falling for these horrible cons that can just devastate you and ruin you financially uh, rather I mean, not to distill it down to a bumper sticker but i have to think knowledge being power if i knew the tactic of a faith healer you know the lengthening the leg miracle or you know the crutches being thrown and all those types of things if i knew how all of that was done before i was presented with an example of it i would be looking for the cracks in that facade, right? I'd be looking and I would think maybe knowledge is power in the scenario of the psychics and the mediums. If you know to look for it, maybe then you might be looking for it. So that's fair. Don't you think? Absolutely. We call this pre-bunking or I used to call it uh, inoculation, the inoculation theory is that if you give people the concepts of how people are conned, how things um, are not what they appear, then you're giving people some sort of skills so that like a toolbox so that whenever they approach something like this it may not be the exact same scenario but they'll be able to feel like you know this does seem a lot like a romance scam 
but it's not romance. It seems to be connected to something else, you know, maybe, um, you know, some other way. So they, because there's so many ways of conning people out there. We can't explain every single way, you know, if it's this, then it's that. We can't do that. But I do think that we need to inoculate people with great information. So how they could find information, how do you evaluate a source? How do you trust that? But again, if you surround yourself with people who will help you through this time, then their expertise also will help because uh, learning about cold reading, learning about hot reading, learning how a, a video is edited to make it look a certain way, how it's manipulating your emotions as you go through, how the music plays on these TV shows at a certain moment, or they cut it right there on a commercial at a time that you will hook you. If we know all that information, that's great. But also sometimes people think they're too smart to be fooled. We see this all the time. James Randi was writing a book called The Magician in a Laboratory about how scientists are some of the easiest people to fool because they're, they think in some cases, they think they're so smart that they, they're not looking at it in the way that um, somebody who's got street smarts would probably look at it. So having too much knowledge and thinking that you're just too smart to fall for it is probably a bad way of going about your life. I still think that the best way of doing this is, of course, be curious and to learn all about the world around you and it, as we all should for all kinds of reasons, but having a really strong friend, family um, network out there around you that is out there for the best interests of you. Also, that means you have to have the best interests of that family member. So we all have to have each other's backs. I've got your back. You've got my back, right? Well, we got each other's back. That's good news. So let's finish with what is the About Time Project and how can people connect with your work? Right. So you can find more information about all the things that I'm involved in at aboutTimeProject.org. And that's About Time Project. But what does it mean? What's the project? The project is it's about time we started taking the stuff seriously and started yeah. looking into it and bonding together and seeing each other in person and hanging out and all those kinds of things, just getting to know and grow our community. I'm adamant about let's growing our community. But the About Time Project, uh, we have our Wikipedia group that is rewriting Wikipedia pages concerning science, scientific skepticism, and claims of the paranormal. We've written over, we've written 2,138 pages. 45% of that is in languages outside of uh, English. And those 2,138 pages have been read 132 million times they've been accessed. Are so you correcting bad information? Oh, oh, what's the work you're doing? Yes, we're creating bad information. We're creating great information. We're translating pages into other languages. No, you're writing. correcting bad information, right? I think creating came out, but I want to make sure that the <laughs> the pedantic types don't come into the comment section and say they're creating bad information. You're correcting bad I'm information. Correct. Right. We're All correct. Right. Yes, I have a team of about 100 people. We're on Facebook, so you have to be on Facebook. The training process is at least four months. And it is an extensive, fun project. That's the Girl of Skepticism on Wikipedia project. I also dabble in a lot of other things. Um, facilitated communication is in my wheelhouse. I'm with a very, uh, really uh, powerful group of people who are bounded together to try to combat facilitated communication. Do you want to explain what that is? Seth? Go ahead. Facilitated, oh, facilitated communication. communication. It's a communication device, they say. I, I have air quotes around the word communication, um, mainly affecting people who have difficulty communicating, um, who've never been able to communicate. I'm talking about people who are severely, um, uh, how do I say this? They're they're severely unable to communicate since birth, you know, since, since they can't read and write. They've not been able to be educated. And what happens is people... There is a small group of people in the world who think they're helping them communicate by holding their hand and placing it over the top of a keyboard, or they hold a letter board in the air and the person points to the letters. So they're not communicating. The facilitator is holding their hand and moving it towards the correct letters. It's, it's, it's incredible. You can find it on Wikipedia. And there's also a website called facilitatedcommunication.org. 
it's it's taking the voice away from this person who cannot communicate in writing or speak like that's a whole other show oh my gosh you and i could i i'm not i i've got i'm gonna stop because otherwise it will be here till next tuesday what's the website Abouttimeproject.org. Susan Gerbic, you are a damn superhero. I just, I'm such a fan of you and your work. I'm thankful for your friendship and I'm sure we'll bump into each other on the road out there, but I'm going to send everybody to you and your work. And I guess we leave everybody, including ourselves, uh, you know, the, the encouragement to stay skeptical. (laughs) We may not be as invulnerable as we think. Susan, thanks again for talking to me. Thank you so much, Seth.